Okay, I see one of the authors. Well, in the meantime, I assume the other authors will be added soon. So um, let me briefly introduce myself and then I'll hand over to Ozan so he can introduce himself and he can introduce the session. So my name is Geert Litjens. I'm assistant professor in computational pathology at Radboud University Medical Center and happy to chair the session on learning with noisy labels and limited data. Ozan. Thank you. Uh, my name is Azan Oktay. Uh, I'm a senior researcher at Microsoft Research Cambridge, and I'm happy to be here today and uh, co-host the session with you. Okay. So for um, everybody as, who hasn't followed a lot of oral sessions, we will start with uh, three, three minute, uh, very short introductions by the three authors whose papers uh, we will uh, discuss today and uh, they will introduce themselves. So I would like to move on to the introduction for the first paper, which is by Louis van Harten on entangling the small intestine in a 3D senior MRI using deep stochastic tracking. All right, thank you for having me. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. All right, yep. uh, indeed, my name is Louis van Harten. I'm a PhD candidate at the Amsterdam UMC, and uh, my work is in uh, untangling the small intestine in 3D CINI MRI using deep stochastic tracking. So um, CINI MRI in the intestine uh, is really about, uh, what we're looking at is a real-time video of the intestine. So we can really look at these uh, intestine and how they're moving, and uh, we can judge are they moving properly, are sections moving less than they should. Um, and for now, it's really a research um, a research modality, but it is gaining some traction in the clinic as well. Uh, but the main uh, object that it has is that these images are really hard to interpret. Uh, they're quite hard to evaluate. And one of the reasons for that is that the uh, small intestine itself has quite a complex geometry. As you can see here on the right, here you have two intestinal sections, two intestinal loops, and they really pass over and under each other in quite complex ways. So when you're looking at these images, it's really hard to, um, uh, to see what's going on, to see which parts are connected. And to make evaluation easier, we try to untangle the intestine. And that, by that point, I mean, uh, we try to stretch this intestine into a long tube that's much easier to evaluate. So uh, this could either be an aid for manual evaluation, or it could be a starting point for a downstream task, so an automatic method. And the way that we get these untangled representations is by, um, by drawing a center line through the intestine itself, and then resampling along that center line. And the results you can see here on the left. So what we're looking for is really center lines. Uh, and because of that, we're basing our method on uh, an earlier published work, which was uh, a center line extraction method for coronary arteries. And the pr basic principle is the same. So we have um, a patch around a center line point. Then we teach a convolutional neural network to predict the directions of that center line. And when we do inference, what we get is this probability distribution of a forwards and a backwards direction. We can mask off one of these uh, forwards or backwards directions. And what we get is this small cluster of possible directions. We take the maximum value, and then we know the direction we should be stepping into. And by iteratively doing that, we can extract a center line. But for this work, the crucial addition that we made was that we made this part stochastic. So rather than taking the maximum value, we now stochastically sample a direction from this probability space. And the big advantage there is that we now have a non-deterministic result. So we can do tracking multiple times, so we can explore the solution space, and then we can detect outliers and ignore those. So the way that that works is uh, by we start tracking with a number of tracking agents. In our experiments, we have 64 of these agents, and they all start tracking at the same time from our start point. Um, and as they are tracking, some of them will lose track of the rest of the pack, basically. So what you see here in yellow is the start point. In white, you see a projection of the ground truth. In orange, you see each of these individual stochastic tracking agents. And in red, you see their average position, so their consensus position. And as you can see, some of these agents are making mistakes, but because they're outliers, these outliers are automatically detected, they're ignored, and the full section is tracked correctly. I think I'm coming up on time, so I'll make it quick here. Uh, so we compared our stochastic method to a baseline deterministic method that you can see here in blue, and we saw some pretty impressive uh, improvements in our results. So I think that's all the time I had. Uh, I'll be very happy to take any questions later. Thank you, Louis, for that uh, introduction. Ozan, do you want to introduce the next paper? Yes, absolutely. 
Um, do we have uh, Nerika uh, in the call? Um, yeah, I'm here. Yes, um, we will like yeah. to listen to your presentation. Thank you. Um, sure. So, um, hello everyone. My name is Niharika and um, oh, can I actually share my screen? I thought that uh, uh, the default presentation would be on. You should be able to share your screen, I guess. Um, okay, yeah, let me just do that. Yes, we can see your screen. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Niharika, and I'm a fifth year PhD student at the ECE department at Johns Hopkins. And I work with Dr. Archana Venkatraman. So today I will present our recent work in deep learning for conic domics. So in this work, we have speci specifically designed a graph neural network called the multimodal GCN or the MGCN to combine information from resting state and DTI connectomes to predict phenotypic measures. So um, in our framework, we have uh, the, the fMRI connectomes as the graph signal with the graph structure for each patient being given by the structural connectivity. And what our MGCN is trying to do is to exploit the complementarity between the two spaces and explore the data geometry in order to predict either single or multiple phenotypic measures. And we validate our framework on two separate data sets of modest sizes, one on a, cognit on a cognitive measures prediction task from the HCP from a subset of the HCP or the human connectome data set, and on a separate uh, multiple measures prediction task for on autism patients to predict multiple impairments. We observe that our framework, as we see in the results to the right, provides improved generalization as compared to a variety of state-of-the-art baselines. And what we see is that uh, we are able to exploit the data geometry with the DTI structural connectomes providing regularization to the framework. And uh, this is a this is a first step in order to uh, better understand uh, complex phenot uh, complex neuropsychiatric disorders such as autism. Um, so I'm looking forward to your questions and I can hand over. That, that's all I had. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, then we can move on to the introduction for the last paper of the session. Yuan Liu, can yep. you call? Yes. Okay. Go so ahead. Could you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Uh, hello, my name is Joy. I'm a postdoctor in Yale. Uh, the work is to improve the model based learning with data augmentation for, for quantity suspended mapping QSM. The QSM is to uh, involve solving a year post involves problem to get the tissue suspendability distribution from the field map, which is a challenging year. You post the problem, especially in the breathing and the, the oh. in the breathing and the classification. And I'm sorry that <laughs> because some someone break in my room, and then and the several deep learning pro, uh, methods have been proposed, which using the Cosmos map or synthetic data for training. However, this method have uh, difficulty to get the training data or, or the domain shift problem. So the work is uh, model-based learning. So we don't need the QSM labels for the network training. And also we use the data augmentation to improve the model-based learning. Here's, uh, the overall, overall framework. So we generated the input, uh, the field perturbation from the random the QSM sources, which have uh, the very high suspicity values. And then they measure the log field and the augmented field are inputted to a convolution network to get the QSM output. 
in the loss function, we have the we have the data consist loss between the queues and output and the measured log field. Also, we have have the total variation loss in the queues and output, so we can suppress the noise. Most importantly, we have the uh, recognition consistent loss between the two queues and output and then the protocol that kills them. So the main idea is uh, to regularize the network training by input perturbation so we can improve the robustness. The work is evaluated on multi orientation data sets. So the, the, the blue one, the blue is uh, my result. We can see the it can better suppress the, the the artifact arriving from the high suspicion regions. Also, it evaluated on the 2019 the and challenges. We compared the submitted uh, several methods. And here is the small classifications. We can see some of the methods have very difficulty to add around this classification, have this sticking artifact. And the, the proposed method achieve a very good performance. And thank you. I'm looking forward to your question. Thank you for that introduction. So now we go into the, the panel discussion. So the questions for the uh, three speakers uh, for the three papers. Um, I would. I don't like... know. I'm sorry. I don't know how to paste this, this one. OK. Seems to have worked out. Um, I would so for people who want oh, to ask, oh, okay. for people who want to ask questions, uh, please type them either in the chat or you can raise your hand. Then you can ask them uh, in person. You will be promoted to panelist by the technical chair. Um, and we have some questions from uh, the study groups which uh, convened uh, this morning. And I would like to start with one question from the study groups from the for the author of uh, paper one. Uh, which is Louis van Harte. And the question is, uh, the authors mentioned that annotating the small intestine for the ground through center line is very challenging uh, for clinicians. Uh, could the authors comment on how these ground truth would affect the performance of the subsequent tracking task? So if you would have a different clinician uh, do the same annotation. Um, I'm not entirely sure if the question it's talking about inter-observer variability, or rather just the quality of the, the network itself. So I suppose I could comment on both, uh, because always you're dealing with the garbage in, garbage out problem. So the, uh, the directions that this network is going to propose are never going to be better than the directions it has been, uh, has been taught. So what is in the training set is going to dictate the upper limit of the quality of the central lines you're extracting. Um, so we currently don't have a way around that, I suppose. Um, as for the inter-observer variability, we didn't actually have a study comparing for, uh, comparing the uh, central lines between different clinicians, so we don't have a number on that yet, as of now. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, so if anybody from the study group is in the call and wants to ask a follow-up question, please type it in the chat or, or raise your hand. Otherwise, for now, at least I was satisfied with the answer. <laughs> uh, so we can move on to the next question. Uh, Ozan, do you have a question for any of the speakers? Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, maybe I can ask you another follow-up question uh, regarding the first uh, uh, presentation. So it's related to the tracking work against, uh, again, uh, Luis. Uh, the question is basically from the audience. Uh, how do you backpropagate uh, gradients uh, through the stochastic uh, sampling? Um, maybe I can also add a, another question to that. Like, uh, do you do you do this like uh, stochastic sampling also at training time, or is it only uh, something at this time? Uh, indeed, the latter. So we avoid this problem by not doing stochastic sampling at training time. Uh, so the networks are trained by purely looking at basically on policy uh, points. So we really look at uh, patches around the ground truth points because that's the point where we can actually back propagate the tangent vectors because there we know the tangent vectors. Uh, so at that point, we're, um, we're basically training them uh, on specific patches to return our tangent vectors. Uh, so we don't actually need to uh, follow a trace to be able to backprop anything. We can just backprop any point on the ground truth. Thank you. 
Would you like to follow up on Pierre if you have any questions? Yeah, so there's another question in the chat uh, from Nicolas Leswan. Um, could you use the outliers you find during uh, your stochastic uh, tracking uh, to further optimize the tracker? That's a really interesting question. It's, uh, I just read it and it's the main problem that we have is that uh, basically any uh, trace that we find, uh, we would have to manually check if this is a correct uh, decision at, at, at each specific point, I suppose. Um, or isn't it? Because uh, because we backpropagate on specific points the tangent vectors, uh, some points on these outliers might be correct tangent vectors. So parts of this outlier might be correct. It might just make a small mistake somewhere and then go into a neighboring uh, intestinal section and there, for the most part, be correct again. So we would have to take these outliers and uh, delineate specific sections where the mistake is, and we could perhaps do something with that during training. But it would take a little bit of manual intervention. But it's an interesting idea. Thank you. Um, I can follow up with uh, another question which was posed in the in the study group uh, this morning. Um, it was posed by Hans Meine. Um, wouldn't you want to reinstate agents when they're terminated in order to keep the number of agents high enough? It looks like the current method would deteriorate with increased tracked segment length. Uh, exactly, it does. And for our case, we can get away with that because our sections are by nature quite short uh, because we're working with a modality where we don't have a lot of depth voxels. So these uh, sections, they go out of frame at points, and they come back into frame. And you never have a very long section that's in frame because, well, that simply doesn't really happen in our, uh, our modality. So um, if you're looking at images where you have um, basically less anisotropy, so more depth voxels, where you have more of the intestines in view, that would be really important, actually. So then you're looking more at, um, it would look more like a beam search, where you would track for a while, then probably reinstate all of your um, tracking agents at that point and basically start again, or do it continuously. There's a few ways to do that. But we could get away with not doing that because our sections are short. OK, thank you for your, uh, your answer. Do you have any other further questions for this paper, Ozan? Uh, yes, maybe I can ask one more. Uh, okay. Can you can you imagine uh, application areas uh, for this methodology beyond uh, what what you presented uh, today? For example, vascular structure extraction, or um, how well do you think it can be applied? And can it handle bifurcation as well? So if you can maybe comment on these uh, things, that would be interesting. Uh, bifurcation is interesting actually because we don't have bifurcations in the small intestine. Um, so in vascular structure, what I could imagine is if you're doing some some sort of beam search that maybe about a third of your, your agents will go one way and like two thirds will go the other way. Uh, if you see that happen, you would probably want to reinstate a new tracker at both of those points. Uh, you would have to build a little bit of um, yeah, machinations around it, I suppose. Uh, but this entire um, work is uh, basically a continuation on a tracker that was made for arteries. So of course the same principles can apply there. Uh, and yes, you would have to do a little bit of extra work, but similar, uh, similar work could apply. Okay, thank, thank you, you Louis, for, uh, for all your answers. Uh, in light of time, I would like to move on to the second paper. Um, we don't have any questions from the study groups for that paper, but uh, I actually have one. Um, so uh, let's wait until, yes, the speaker is present. Um, so actually, if I look at the, the results in the table, it looks quite impressive. I think your method really improves on the baselines across the board. The main question I had was, for example, if you look at the CFIS uh, results, uh, I see that the, the mean average error is uh, around 14-ish, 15-ish, uh, and you improve on it with like 1.3, 1.2, roughly, uh, compared to the best baseline. I was just wondering, are these improvements clinically, re clinically relevant? Uh, would it alter treatment uh, if they would use your method or treatment or uh, the way the patients are handled if they use your method versus the baselines? Um, okay, okay, yeah. Um, thanks for the question. So, 
um, within this work, at least right now, um, it's not been it's not been transferred to a clinical setting. And what we are looking at is really a first um, exploratory step where we are trying to build methods that uh, work well in settings where there where there is less amount of data available. For example, that would be typical of um, a neuroimaging study in a clinical setting. For example, if you look at the autism data set here, we have um, just about 60 patients, and in that case. Most of the baselines fail to um, do well on predicting multiple impairments. So uh, I wouldn't say that at the moment it's something that would be clinically transferable or used in order to make a clinical decision. But we are hoping that um, further explorations in this regard would um, make it more robust such that it could be deployed in a clinical setting, say for evaluating efficacy of behavioral therapies, for example, if we look at um, um, the context of neuropsychiatry psychiatric disorders. Um, so that's where that's at at the moment. Okay, thank you. Clear answer. Do you have any questions, Ozan, or I can ask one from the chat? Please. Uh, okay, please. so there's a, a question in the in the chat from Matthias Heinrich. Uh, to my understanding, the graph Laplacian in your method is fixed based on the presence of fiber tracks and unweighted. Could you comment on whether this might be a limitation? Um, yeah, thanks for that question. So I, I think this was also a part of one of the reviewer discussions about the unweighted versus the weighted graph Laplacian. So one of the things with uh, DTI connectivity and why we chose to actually use the unweighted graph Laplacian is that uh, during fiber tracking, one of the things that uh, could commonly occur is missing of really of small tracks in favor of large tracks. So in order to avoid this, what we had done is uh, thresholded this graph Laplacian matrix from deep up. So the um, adjacency matrix that we obtain from um, the probabilistic fiber tracking such that we don't miss such small tracks in lieu of larger ones. But if we were to say use um, a weighted graph Laplacian, this would also be one of the problems we would have to um, account for. So I would say that at the moment, from the point of view of the method um, and how it's formulated, it should be agnostic to whether it's a weighted graph Laplacian or an unweighted graph Laplacian. But from the point of view of the application domain space, uh, one would have to take care as to how one is handling uh, the DTI connectivity data and whether we are missing such small tracks in lieu of larger tracks or not. OK. Um... So I see, uh, see from the chat that Matthias was uh, satisfied with your answer. So that's good. Um, do you have any questions for the paper, Ozan? Uh, yes, uh, I would like to ask maybe a follow-up question. Um, so regarding the, the baseline approach that um, you presented uh, in your work, uh, the, the one that's related to diffusion only without using the anatomical uh, Laplacian graph. Mm -hmm. um, as I understand, uh, or maybe I can first start the question, uh, does the network uh, learn the topology uh, on the fly, or like what kind of like a topology do you um, um, enforce on a training time for the uh, graph convolution network? Um, that's a great question, actually. So um, at the moment, if we are excluding the graph Laplacian, what we are doing is assuming uh, that uh, each of um, each of the um, each of uh, the regions in the brain are actually connected to every other region. So it's not reweighting uh, this connectivity space according to an anatomical connection. So a priori, it's not assuming any other structure apart from that that's enforced by um, um, that's enforced by the resting state fMRI itself. So um, as such, uh, what what this would be equivalent to saying is that we don't assign importances to how different nodes are connected with each other. So that's essentially saying that a priori we are not regularizing the network based on an underlying prior uh, on underlying prior knowledge and allowing the network to learn what it thinks is most important just based on the resting state data. Very interesting. And um... Can you imagine that, like, for example, with sufficient data, one could actually uh, start with a prior uh, topological network of, like, uh, based on the DTI, and then let the network learn this, like, a topology on the fly? Have you have you considered uh, such a thing? 
Um, so that's an interesting question. And uh, one thing that I might think at, at the moment is a limitation is actually the size of the data set, just um, based on how many parameters one would have to learn if, say, one were and, uh, trying to learn the topology of brain connectivity or enforce some hierarchy on these connections. But that's something that would be very interesting to think about, especially if we have um, a larger number of scans, such as with the entire HCP data set. And uh, one thing that uh, we think would be interesting is whether uh, we can learn some sort of hierarchy in how the brain is organized and use this in the construction of the graph neural network to automatically say um, mimic something like community detection or clustering in order to guide this representation learning. But at the moment, I would say that um, at least with the second data set, the limitation would be with the number of patients that we have. And um, we wouldn't be able to say at the moment that it would learn something reasonable versus not, given that uh, the parameters parameterization would be pretty large compared to the number of parameters we would be learning in this work, for example. Okay, thank you for uh, for all your answers, Nierika. Um, in light of time, let's move on to the, uh, the third paper of the session. Um, so let's see if, yes, Yuan Liu is still here. Um, so we yeah. have some questions from the study group uh, for your paper. And the first question was, uh, could the authors comment on how each individual regularization term affects the Q QSM performance? In other words, how would ablation studies leaving out the individual contributions affect the recovery performance? And which of the terms would uh, offer the most performance benefit? Uh... Yeah, we have two the regularization laws. Why is uh, imposed on the inside of the the perturbated susceptibility sources? Why is it kind of outside? So we kind of uh, uh, did some experiment how to just uh, try to balance that. But uh, from that, it is. Well, yeah, we have a lot of time. But right now, I didn't find that this can make a very uh, strong differences on the result. So right now, the 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 two the loss loss waiting term is just equal. Okay, so if you would remove them, would you see deteriorated performance? If you would remove the other regularization terms, like lambda no. two and lambda three, if you would set them to zero. You, you mean the no recognition loss or? Yes. I understand. Uh, if we don't need any of the recognition loss, the, it's the, the method that we proposed is uh, the, the, the reconstructions and we have the artifacts you, you, you can see in the result. Okay. So, Ozan, we have time for one last question, so I'll give you the honor. Thank you. Uh, we have got one more question uh, from the study group. Um, so, the question is uh, the following. Uh, the metrics in the tables uh, seem to provide a glo global assessment of the performance quality, rather than focusing on local patches within the acquisition. Uh, could the authors comment on this choice for this application? I'm happy to repeat the question if it was un if it was unclear. Uh, yeah, we we in the in the table we did uh, the quantity evaluations, but uh, this quantity of the matrix is the evaluated on the whole image, and uh, they have some limitations on this this kind of evaluation. First, uh, for the for the multi orientation data, we use the, the cosmos as the ground truth. Actually, the, the cosmos map also have some errors from the calculation. Also, it did point out that, uh, like the QSM community, that this kind of quantity matrix actually can very effectively to, to evaluate the image quality. Um, but right now, there's an there's no very effective the matrix which can very to evaluate the QSM quality. So we also so that's why the the visual assessment is very important. 
Okay. Okay. Um, given time, we have to uh, to stop here. Uh, we had had some more questions, but uh, they will have to wait uh, for the poster session later on. So uh, I'll invite everybody to take a nice break in uh, Gather Town, and uh, the next session will uh, start at quarter to five. See us uh, local time in Dublin. Thanks, Yad, um, and thanks, Ozan.